As a preparation for this Deep Blue Sea event, I, I, I went to a, a, an art exhibit. I think I'll walk out in front here. Um, so it was an exhibit by a, a mantis a shrimp from the Andaman Sea off the coast of Thailand. And uh, this shrimp uh, exhibit, uh, I happened to be standing next to the artist as I was looking at the painting. And I said, you know, this side of the painting is certainly very beautiful, but why did you leave this side of the painting blank? And the little shrimp said, well, I don't know what you're talking about. It's a, this is the most beautiful part of the painting. It's got these beautiful ultraviolet hues. Mm -hmm. and, and I said, oh, yeah, uh, I don't see ultraviolet light. And the shrimp said, oh, and scampered away. And so uh, Anais Nin said, uh, quote, we don't see the world as it is. We see it as we are, end quote. And I think this is the, the basis of what I've been trying to do, is to try to see the world as an other creature will perceive it. And once uh, I've crossed into a certain kind of threshold of what I believe to be understanding, I may be just making it up, but it feels like it's true, is that they are capable of appreciating beauty. And um, what I'd like to do is have a little, um, have a little uh, ex experiment here, so an, an audience participation. And you can help create art for another species. And so uh, as a template, what I'd like to start with is, let's say we have a, a landscape, imagine a landscape for us, and we think it's beautiful. It's got a mountain, a snow-capped mountain, and a stream, and a, a lake. And it has a verdant valley, some trees, puffy white clouds. So we see this as beautiful. It's got a fresh water source. It's good for us. Uh, the green and the puffy white clouds indicate the right kind of temperature for us. The valley, we're probably good megafauna of hunting grounds. And we have prospect and refuge with the trees to see and not be seen. So that's perfect for us. So what would a good work of art be? A painting for, say, a vulture. Anyone? Highway. highway. We've got a highway. Blacktop highway. Yes? Flies and carcasses. I like, yes, I like that. Um, and anybody? Any else? I'm thinking of kind of the heat waves. They like that rising currents. Beautiful. So now, how about for a naked mole rat? <laughs> It probably wouldn't be a painting at all, because they don't see very well. So uh, what kind of art might we have for a naked mole rat? Anybody want to launch into the naked mole rat art? What's that? Tuber. Tuber. Yeah. I bet that it's smelly. And I'm thinking dirt, like not too wet, not too dry, just like nice compactable something, smells of worms, maggots. Yeah, so, so art for these species would be something that we probably would recognize something as vulgar. But to them, that would be just right. Um, Thomas Nagel uh, wrote a paper where he talked about, uh, perhaps I can imagine what it's like for me to be a bat. But what is it like for a bat to be a bat? And I'd like to tackle that question directly, is that the, um, the Brazilian free-tailed bat is about 2,500 times smaller than the average human by weight. It holds the recently discovered horizontal flight speed record of 160 kilometers per hour, which totally crushes uh, the fastest bird, by the way. And they communicate about 46 times faster than we do. Uh, and by the way, uh, a bat cannot hear that pitch. And so if there are these little bats hanging upside down thinking, well, I wonder what it's like for a human to be a human, they probably think that we're just barely moving, silent giants stuck to the ground. They feel very sorry for us being so nothing going on there. <laughs> so I had the opportunity to write a melody for a bat <coughs> up here at Georgetown University once. And the one bat who heard the melody seemed to like the melody. It was, wired up to its uh, amygdala, and so that's how they could tell. And uh, in preparation for this, I had been listening to bat calls, and uh, 
the, the back call you're about to hear was already slowed down 10 times. What I would do with these calls is I'd slow them down into our hearing range, or our vocal range, rather, and, and take musical dictation. So I would just write down the melodies of these calls. I, I was supposed to have started <coughs> this whole talk with two monkey calls that you weren't supposed to know what they were. So when I hit this, it's going to be kind of the wrong song. But, uh, but you'll have to get that news later. So this is the call of the bat slowed down 10 times so that we could hear it. That was it. Now, here you'll hear now that same call slowed down an additional 36 times so that it's in our, our vocal range. So that entire little sentence took a little less than a 20th of a second. And so it's something while I have these ocean researchers here, I wanted to say this kind of listening, I think, would be very, and slowing down would be very good for us because I think especially in cetaceous communication where, where many of them hear higher than bats, uh, what we think of as clicks may contain a great deal of information. So um, the importance of the nuances of those kinds of calls was, was made clear to me when I, the first work that I did was with cotton top tamarind monkeys. And the, the history behind it was that I had spent a few years taking apart music and, and felt that I had uh, come up with something of the recipe, as it were, of how music uh, was put together, how it's the origins and, and effective processes. And so any good theory is testable. So one test of the theory is if I was right, I should be able to take this recipe of how music is made and take the ingredients that are now designed for humans and replace them with the ingredients that are designed for another species. I should be able to make music that's effective for that other species. So I contacted the eminent primatologist, Charles Snowden, and uh, he was intrigued with the ideas enough to uh, point me towards a library of calls that uh, this, the, the monkeys that he had, a colony of these monkeys at the time, very uh, wide range of a repertoire of their calls. And each of the calls has a, a kind of a charming name, like the chevron chatter, which is something they, they announced they found some good food. The ascending multi-whistle is a mother to infant call. And so at one time, uh, what, I, what I'd done, you know, as I take my musical dictation, I had to slow them down about eight times to get them into our register. And so uh, one day he sent me two new calls, the S SL Multi and the SL Trill. And uh, so I did what I usually do. I slowed them down and listened to them. And here you'll hear the SL Multi. First you'll hear the real call in real time, and then you'll hear it slowed down eight times. And this is the slower version. Sounds like a horror show. Well, and here is the SL trill. Again, you'll hear the real time and then slowed down eight times. <laughs> exactly. Isn't that funny how, ha, 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 that sounded like a... Well, I had to sit down when I heard that the first time. It's an E-flat major scale, starting on G. Of course, we thought we invented E-flat major. But, so um, I wrote back to Chuck uh, somewhat hesitantly because he hadn't agreed to put any funding or time into a study. And I said, I hate to tell you your business, but I don't think these belong in the same category. One sounds like a threat or it's a, it's a kind of alarm call. Uh, it has it, uh, a very harsh tone, irregular rhythms, and dissonant intervals. The other, I think, is some kind of friendly, effective in-group vocalization. It's got very regular um, rhythm and normal harmonic vocalization. 
and uh, consonant intervals. And it was then that he decided to go ahead and do the study because he rather liked the idea that based on a musical analysis, I was able to generally tell him what they were talking about. As it turned out, the first was a, a response to a perceived threat, and the second was an all clear sound. And so uh, we did the study, and uh, I could say that the, uh, the uh, I wrote two kinds of music, some that was designed to get them riled up, and it got them riled up, another kind of music designed to calm them down, and then it got them calmed down, which is a bit of a trick because these animals are jumping and chirping all the time. It's their defensive um, posture. And so um, it was the first study that showed a response to music from many species other than human. And we did another study following up on that on domestic cats, which, uh, which I've, I have some here. This is my, some of my music for cats. Technically, I should say, since I'm in the National Academy of Sciences, this is actually music for cats and humans. There is below the, the vocal register of the cats, this is like traffic noise to them, but we understand it's in our vocal register. So that's where I put human music to make it palatable to humans, because I figured the study that they did of the cotton top tamarind monkeys, the researchers found all of the music for the monkeys irritating. <laughs> and so I thought, if the people find it's irritating, they're not, they're not gonna turn it on for their cats. So it's technically kind of music for both species. So. I'd like to finish with uh, saying that I think it's, um, uh, it's possible that to create beauty for other species, and in fact, I would go as far as to say since we can do it, we should do it. Because more and more uh, captive species are only viable in captivity, and we tend to throw them in a room with four walls and, and a spare tire, call it <coughs> enrichment. And I think we, uh, we owe it to them to perceive the world somewhat as they do, and to provide some kind of uh, beauty for them. And if we do, I think, uh, if you think about it, we can increase the amount and diversity of beauty in the world. Thank you.